Hello, welcome to the Thursday, July 7th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I am recording from Frankfurt, Germany. I wrote up a real quick uh, diary today about subject alternate names. Uh, these are additional names that you can add to a TLS certificate in order to validate multiple host names. And the big question I try to answer is how many subject alternate names are you able to add to a certificate? Turns out the specification actually is not very specific about this. The RFCs kind of suggest that this is a implementation dependent parameter. And with that, of course, no compatibility and such uh, comes to mind as a possible problem. Well, it uh, turns out that um, certificate authorities typically allow at least 100. For example, Let's Encrypt, and now there are a couple. Komodo, for example, allows 1,000, and some sources say that Komodo actually allows 2,000. But uh, overall, you probably want to stay at 100 or less uh, to ensure that uh, your certificate is compatible. Most organizations will never get anywhere close to 100, but of course, if you have things like load balancers, proxies and such that are protecting a large number of websites, then 100 may easily be reached. And Fortinet did release its monthly update for July. And with that, we got patches for 11 vulnerabilities and four of them have a rating of high. Among the high vulnerabilities, one that sort of sticks out immediately is a MySQL issue that there is no root user password configured, which does allow an authenticated user to then get to the command prompt and essentially just take over MySQL on the device. The second interesting vulnerability is a code execution vulnerability via a stack-based buffer overflow. Now, the reason this is only rated as high, not critical, is that it has a number of dependencies, like, for example, the attacker already has to have a privileged uh, position and then needs to be able to execute commands via the command line interface. Given all the attention that these types of vulnerabilities have gotten from attackers in recent years, uh, please update uh, these uh, devices expeditiously. And the SAN security awareness team uh, did publish the July edition of its Ouch newsletter. And this time it goes into a little bit of detail on more advanced phishing scams and how users can identify them or can be trained to identify them. These Ouch newsletters are typically targeting a less technical user. So that's something to share with family and of course use in your organization's security awareness program. And quantum computing and the threats it poses to currently use the public private key encryption algorithms and digital signature algorithms is one of those big unknowns where nobody really knows will it matter, when it will matter. But in order to get ready for it, NIST has started a process to come up with encryption algorithms that will be quantum safe. NIST identified four different algorithms that will make it into the fourth round of this process. One is for a key establishment. Uh, that's uh, the Crystal's Kuiper algorithm, as they call it. And then they have three different algorithms for digital signatures. First of first crystals dilithium which they say will be working for most use cases then falcon which will provide shorter signatures and then interestingly a third one a sphinx which uses a different type of algorithms the other algorithms are lattice based which are commonly considered uh, quantum safe but NIST sort of wants to hedge its bets here a little bit by also including one algorithm that's not based on lattice based encryption in order uh, to protect itself in case something is fundamentally wrong with lattices 
No final decision has been made yet, and NIST is, like I said, just in the fourth round of this process. Now looking for feedback. Uh, these processes take years, and that's why NIST already starts now with the process, even though there is no sort of indication of an immediate demise of RSA and elliptic curve algorithms. And of course, I recommend as you are seeing these algorithms show up in various libraries or so that you start experimenting with it, start trying them out for some of your applications. Encryption doesn't get better with H and it's always best to use the most current algorithms and methods that you can afford to use. And Apple announced in response to some of the exploits we have seen from, for example, NSO Group and such over the last couple of years, that starting with iOS 16, they will introduce an optional lockdown mode. And this lockdown mode is sort of something a little bit different than what we have seen before from Apple in that it will specifically disable a wide range of technologies, in particular sort of convenience and performance improvements to iOS in order to reduce the attack surface. For example, in messages, you will not see any attachments, but images. Also, FaceTime calls will not be accepted unless the recipient first initiated a call to the caller. So a number of different tricks here to sort of prevent some of these one-click or zero-click uh, malware uh, attacks that we have seen uh, in the past. It will be interesting to see how usable a phone in lockdown mode will be to the average user. But of course, this is, as Apple points out, really more intended for individuals that consider themselves uh, the target of some of these more advanced attacks. And that's it for today. It's also it for this week. There will be no podcast on Friday because I will be traveling. We are planning an update to the look and feel of the United Storms on our website, possibly on Friday if things go well. So don't be too surprised if the site looks a little bit different. And let me know if you run into any functionality issues at that point. But talk to you again on Monday. Bye.